Greetings, my fellow freedom lotus sovereign thinkers. Thank you for tuning in to LO3 Podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date is Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. Yeah, it's nice and uh, chilly out there. I love it. And um, just did a little browsing. And I just found, out, found this out that uh, from Channel 7 News. A man appointed to a commission that recommends judicial appointments to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is resigning because of a search warrant served on a former Department of Head employee has criticized the state's COVID-19 data. So, um, it's interesting on that aspect. I know we're going to be talking about this. And it's funny because it did that raid. How come I see people really griping about you know Roger Stone when the FBI swarmed him? You know, and uh, I always question that, too. And I read, of course, I read the stuff, too, from the Daily Mail about her past, some of her past history. Some people don't like it when you throw it back at them. Like, hey, he's a credibility issue. And some people like to maybe jump the gun on it. You know, I, you know people like to flat their damn gun because they hate one person so much. Anything, 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 anything they do is like, Garbage, you know, it's like you know, President Trump, the greatest scapegoat in presidential history. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, if he if I fart, blame it on him. Same with DeSantis. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of errors I'm not too crazy about about him. I didn't even vote for the man because, um, based on his uh past practices as a congressman, and don't get me wrong, I didn't support Gillum either because he was owned and branded by you know, George Soros, he admitted it so. And his uh, platform wasn't impress- impressive either. So that's why I always got to be vigilant when it comes to government. So I might have to look into it a little bit more, but I just don't want to be with all the tirades and all the people that hate the man so much. I like to get all the information, collect it thoroughly, facts. Because remember, the police made that claim that they're standing there for 20 minutes. I'm just wondering if there are video cameras for that. If they have them handy because... It would be good documentation, and I could, uh, a lot of us could take it from there. But uh, that's my little intake on it, and I'm not jumping the gun. I'm Rebecca Jenkins, you know, like I said, there's some controversy with her from past practice, and I did verify on a restraining order, cyber stalking cases, you know, so, um, you know, but you know, people don't, probably, people say, oh, it don't matter. So yeah, but, you know, it's called credibility. You always got to look at all the rough edges. We all have them, one way or the other. Because sometimes the state will use that against you or Rebecca Jones. But um, I'm not going to fall for the hype. I didn't, I didn't have to look at the, the video one more time. I know the video can't, the video that uh, Miss Jones recorded it was pretty brief. I don't know if I have to see if there's an actual gun pointed at the person's head. Exhibition could be better, but I like to see the FDLE's officers involved, you know, with their body cameras as well. I'm just going to take their word for it. They stood there for 20 minutes. I like to verify things. So, um, that's how I look at it. And like I said, it's nothing new. It's just a shame. And sometimes, you know, there's a thing called cause and effect as well. You don't just flap your gums. Just do it. And they have to prepare. So, um, well, hopefully, you know, Rebecca Jones do get, does get exonerated if there's no, uh, if she's not a prime suspect, because right now she's a, she's on the potential list, but not the prime suspect. So um, she's not hopefully not don't get indicted. But we have to wait and see. Because remember, if it does occur, all all um, everyone's presumed guilty until prove everyone's presumed innocent. All suspects are presumed presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. We still have those. We gotta exercise them. So, um, hey, it's gonna be. I might, I might have to look into it a little bit more instead of all the exploited hype. Yeah, another thing too. Looks like uh, the U.S. Supreme Court shot down the GOP's um, challenge on the Pennsylvania's election laws or certification. So, um, according to the Epoch Times, and you know, hey, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna sweat, be sweating bullets. The facts are coming out of the woodworks, and of course, even the fact checkers are just a bunch of uh, 
buffoon as far as I'm concerned. You know, oh, they're not suitcases. Yeah, they're, they're Pelican cases. But, you know, all you got to do is look at that. Instead of telling me, oh, fact check information. That's all for a bunch of hacks and a whirly and snowflakes. Well, I'm not in that, I'm in that category. So, too bad what you think. So, I'll just do a little brief rant on those areas. Speaking of the elections, um, I was listening to Mike Adams be talking about the elections on the situation update today on the elections of Sir Bill and Void. It's very interesting. Um, I was looking at the, the article he was um, he talking about. However, it's just... Um, but this one just came out today. And um, it was uh, under the natural born citizen worldpress.com according to this according to one site um the post email.com is written by Leo Donna Donna Frio supposedly Donna Frio so it was it says here about electors must be appointed on election day period and this one says right here three uh title 3 USC Section 7 proves electors must be appointed on election day, not certification day. So, so we'll let's narrate it from here. The single election day issue and Foster versus Love, the unanimous SCOTUS opinion behind it, just got a big boost of adrenaline from the Gateway Pundit linking to solid research at thepostemail.com. In comments at TGB... Three important issues that deserve discussion were raised. Below, I provide historical, legal, and constitutional answers to all of them. One, some are saying that electors are actually appointed when the state certifies the election, not on election day. Two, we have early voting via absentee ballots, so this disproves single election day. Three, back in 1845, when the single election day statute was passed, they will gather statewide results. Let's take them in order. Electors must be appointed on election day, not certification day. It was all over the media that California only just certified their presidential electors on April 4th, a, um, a, on December 4th. AP also reported that Hawaii, Colorado, and New Jersey still have not certified their, their results. By now, reading this, will understand that 3 U.S. Code Section 1 requires that electors shall be appointed on election day. That statute is... You, um... You, unambiguous. But 3 U.S. Code Section 7 provides more guidance. One moment. Okay. It says here, the electors of president and vice president of each state shall meet and give their votes on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December next following their appointment at such place in each state as the legislator of such state shall direct. Okay, I remember um, even um, Tom Fitton from the Judicial Watch Judicial Watch talked about that as well. So it says here, so, um, so plug December 4, 2020 into 3 U.S. Code Section 7 to determine the day on which electors shall meet and give their votes, but don't use Election Day, November 3rd, as the day of the appointment, but instead plug in December 4th, the day California certified electors. The first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, next following December 4th, is December 21st, not December 14th, if December 4th, um, for a day of California certification is also the day of appointment. Then California must have electors meet and vote on December 21st. However, everyone knows that the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3, requires that presidential electors on the same day in each state, and this year, that date is December 14th, as directed by Congressional enactment of 3 U.S. Code Section 7. Therefore, it's obvious that Congress never intended certification and appointment as the same thing. There could not be certain uniform day for electors to meet. If the states appoint all electors on different days and states like California choose to certify later than others thereby violating the uniform electors code at 
3 U.S. Code 7. McPherson versus Blacker, the controlling SCOTUS case everyone should be familiar with by now, addressed the language of appointment. The Constitution does not provide that the appointment of electors shall be by popular vote, nor that the electors shall be voted for upon a general ticket, nor that the majority of those who exercise the elector franchise can alone choose the electors. It recognizes that the people act through their representatives in the legislature and leaves it to the legislator exclusively to define the method of affecting the object. The framers of the Constitution employed words in their natural sense, and where they are plain and, plain and clear, resort to collateral aids to interpretation is necessary and cannot be indulged in to narrow or enlarge that the text. It has been said that the word appoint is not the most appropriate word to describe the results of a popular election. Perhaps not, but it is sufficiently comprehensive to cover that mode and was manifestly used as a conveying the broadest power of determination. So, here we have the black letter law laid down by SCOTUS stating that appointment with regard to 3 U.S. Code 1 means election. If a popular election is held, it does not mean certification. The electors shall be appointed on election day. If there was no popular election, then the electors are directly appointed by the legislator. And let's have a new quote from this case to further illustrate the plenary authority of the legislators. The clause under consideration does not read that the people or the citizen shall appoint, but that each state shall, and if the words, in such manner as a legislator thereof may direct, had been omitted, it would seem that the legislative power of appointment could not have been successfully questioned in the absence of any provision in the state constitution in that regard. Hence, the insertion of those words, while operating as a limitation upon the state in respect of any attempt to circumscribe, the legislative power cannot be held to operate as a limitation on that power itself. If the legislator possesses plenary authority to direct the manner of appointment and might itself exercise the appointing power by joint ballot or concurrence of the two houses or according to such mode as designated, it is difficult to perceive why, if the legislator prescribes as a method of appointment choice by vote, it must necessarily be by general ticket and not by districts. In other words, the act of appointment is none the less the fact of the state in its entirety because arrived by, at, by districts for the act is the act of political agencies duly authorized to speak for the state and the combined result in the expression of the voice of the state as a result reached by a direction of this legislator to whom the whole subject is committed. Our state legislator better start take, talk, taking their heads out of the, out of the sand because see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Sergeant Schultz, I see nothing. I ain't cut it, folks. Ain't gonna cut it, folks. Denying your power doesn't absolve you of the disaster caused by your failing to use the power. You are going to own the result. Legislators, the framers entrusted you with this awesome responsibility. Our soldiers have died to preserve it. Hunkering down and praying for Inauguration Day to come fast is not a strategy that you can avail yourselves. The Democrats don't own this mess. The SCOTUS does not own it. The GOP doesn't own it. And with the villains who caused this certainly need to face justice, should any such concept survive this disaster, they won't own it either. Your state legislators own this. The safety and well-being of the nation are squarely in your hands tonight with an honor. 
like the Supreme Court told you in McPherson versus Blacker and Bush versus Gore, the legislator may resume the power at any time. The words are unqualified, unambiguous, and they apply to you. Stop asking the governors for help, appoint electors, and direct them where to meet. You control the meeting place by law. You can change it by resolution, teleconference, pizza, and coffee. You have the plenary duty. Submit to state Congress. Submit the slate to Congress. If the governor tries to submit another slate, go to court for a writ of prohibition to stop him. Get SCOTUS, get to SCOTUS when there. Congress authorized by early voting absentee ballot. Article linked above by Ren Jander, the postemail.com, has it has this all covered by discussing Ninth Circuit case that interpreted Foster versus Love. And as it reads here, in Voting Integrity Project versus Keesling, it's in 2011, the Ninth Circuit Court reviewed an Oregon statute that allowed early voting by mail, holding that nothing in Foster versus Love prohibited early voting, as long as the election was not consummated under Federal Election Day. While Oregon allowed early voting well before Election Day, unlike the Louisiana case, Oregon also continued voting on Election Day, the same day the election was decided. So, saying here, they can do the early absentee ballots, early voting, as long as everything's done on Election Day. Period. No breaks. Like what happened in Georgia. There's some evidence, video evidence on that, physical evidence, that they stopped everything and they, they had people leave, come back the next morning. Then, of course, you see the... You see, like, the video of them pulling, pulling, pulling out Pelican cases under the table and started doing the balloting. That's null and void. That's Georgia now. Okay, null and void. So, and, um, so that, that, that's, that's a fact, okay? So I'm just letting you folks know here. All right, it says here, the Ninth Circuit took notice of federal statutes that require the states to accommodate absentee ballots which inherently require multi-day early voting, holding that 2 U.S. Code 7 did not conflict with early absentee ballot voting because the evils of early voting were not encouraged by it. Since the results of early voting were not released to the public until Election Day and therefore could not influence later elections, the Ninth Circuit assumed Congress intended both statutes to coexist. Early voting is only part of the election, as long as the election isn't consuming, consummated prior to election day, the Ninth Circuit was cool with it. Will SCOTUS be cool with it? I think so, because Congress is given authority over the time of choosing elections. And McPherson SCOTUS stated that not even the legislator could mess with the time. And in that case, Michigan was forced to change her statute to comply with Congress setting a uniform day for electors to meet, just as Louisiana was forced to change her statute, allowing federal elections to be consummated in October. You can look at the previous post on that. In Foster v. Love, the court defined the election as a combined action of actions of voters and officials in selecting a winner on that day, prescribed by Congress, a.k.a. Election Day. This is why... Throughout the oral argument for Foster versus Love, the law was consistently referred to as the Federal Election Day statute. Each voting is allowed because Congress has authorized it by way of absentee ballot statutes, but Congress has not authorized late ballots or canvassing past the Election Day, and that to extend a state by legislative enactment or otherwise. Let's call it executive branch usurpation, as happened in both Pennsylvania and Georgia. Such extensions are preempted by the elect federal election day statutes, as with the holding in Foster versus Love and McPherson versus Black uh, Blacker, which held the third clause of Section One of Article Two of the Constitution is Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors 
and the day on which they give their votes, which today shall be the same throughout the, all, the, the United States. The state law in question here fixes the first Wednesday of December as the day for the meeting of the electors, as originally designated by Congress. In this respect, it is in conflict with the act of Congress and must necessarily give way. You see how they did that? State law cannot change federal election day. Louisiana tried that, but Louisiana got squashed 9-0. You can't consummate the election on any other day besides the day prescribed by Congress. This year, falling on November 3rd, 2020. It's okay to have early voting as long as the states didn't allow the results to be known and as long as the election is consummated before election day. That being understood, in what universe does Congress allow a federal election to be consummated after federal election day? Not the one we are living in, unless we are now living in a nation completely untethered to federal statutes and long-held Supreme Court precedent. And you can apply the same analysis of the Georgia runoff in the Purdue race. So far, it's been accepted that 2 U.S. Code Section 8 applies to Senate races, but I don't see the Senate mentioned in the text of that statute. Georgia faced this question in 1992, the public citizen case, but that was decided five years before Foster versus Love, and frankly, it was decided wrong by lower courts. SCOTUS did not decide that one. My analysis is that the Purdue runoff is illegal. There was a failure to elect, according to Georgia law, which conflicts with federal law, and as such, I believe the governor must appoint a senator until the next statewide election in Georgia, which is, isn't until 2022. You folks in Georgia need to step up and get this issue into court like yesterday. And while you're at it, check Justice Scalia's, uh, Scalia's majority opinion in Arizona versus Intertribal, where the court refused to decide if voter registration is a qualified vote. If it is held, voter registra- that voter registration is a qualification to vote, that would end all chances of pipe playing the Senate runoff in the Senate runoff, because you only because you only be able to vote in the runoff if you have been registered to vote in the general election on November third. As it stands now, anyone who registered to vote in Georgia thirty days before the election can vote in a runoff. But if somebody challenges the NRVA with an emergency application of SCOTUS, citing the exact behavior Congress sought to end by having uniform elections pipe plan, then you could get a historical ruling that voter registration is a qualification to vote. The Constitution gives the states plenary authority to, plenary authority to choose qualifications to vote for senators. Georgia law requires registration to have been accomplished before the general election. For a person to vote in a runoff, as it stands now, that state lost conflicts with the NRVA, but, but SCOTUS is specifically kicked the issue down the road, re-registration versus qualification in the Arizona versus intertribal case. So if you can get SCOTUS to look at it now, you might stop late registered voters from from in, from in Georgia or without from voting in the runoff. The Purdue issue and the NRVA issue deserves more depth coverage. You need to get this over to Linwood and Sidney Powell at all. Okay, technology in 1845. The single federal election day statute for presidential elections was made law in 1845. However, it was not going to be relevant until 1848. The next presidential election, by, 19, by 1845, the telegraph had became, become an exacting mode of new communication. And by 1848, it was spread far and wide throughout the country. Before 1845, multi-day popular elections were common but Congress has seen enough fraud to enact the uniform day for appointment. Besides the Pony Express, the Telegraph added another mode of sharing voting results. 
the ele single election day became law, and when a state needed an exemption from the election day statute, Congress enacted a separate one-time exception statute to accommodate them. This happened twice in 1872 for Texas and Louisiana. Know the law, no history. If we don't educate our nation better, we are finished. The end is closer than it has ever been. Well, you can't argue with him on that. A lot of good history here. And I'm going to leave a little article, too, on the, um, from by the, by the post email.com is in reference to elections undecided by midnight are void. Undecided by elections undecided by midnight are void and preempted by federal law. Foster versus Love it tells you all about it. And a person named Ren Jander wrote this. And I'll just, I'll just, I'll just make this, um, read the top of this says here. It came out November 18th, by the way. It says, when the, uh, Federal statutes speak of an election. They plainly refer to the combined elections actions of voters and officials meant to make a final selection of an office holder by establishing a particular day as a day on which these actions must take place. The statutes simply regulate the time of the election, a matter on which the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the final say. <laughs> That's from that case, Foster versus Love, 1997. And you can read it yourself. It tells you everything about it, finesse, and it explains about uh, Bush versus Gore. So it's um it's good stuff here. So uh, folks, I recommend you read that. And um, so definitely read that. And what I'm gonna do too, I'm gonna add the U.S. Code House uh, U.S. Code dot House dot Gov, and you can look at Title Three. Explains everything about about the. About the president, the, the the sections and all that, so you can make your own judgment. And I put the U.S. Constitution there as well, so it'll give you some little reading to do. And it's pretty damn. Oh wait, oh I got it, I got it. Okay, I thought I, I didn't have it on here. And I got that too. So yeah, it's, it's good to know these things. And trust me, trust me, when you learn these stuff, man, it's incredible. Even person like myself always try to review view things, and um. And do your and do your own research and share it with others, okay? And that will be it. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share us throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, if you send something that's interesting, you want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to Corn. Furthermore, I'll leave the footnotes what I what I addressed on my speaker page. And if you want to um, contact me, you can hit me at LokiLuck number three at gmail.com or LokiLuck numbers zero three at protonmail.com. And hey, if you want, if you send donations to you know the e post the post email dot com, or um, even to um, nat uh, natural born citizen dot wordpress dot com, that'd be great. Or if you want to send me some contributions or love, yeah, <laughs> you can hit me at paypal dot me forward slash lucky luck number three. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. And may your guardian spirits be with you.